What's going on guys? It's Kirk with Langflix Media. I'm by myself this time, but I'm actually going to be doing a double episode episode of uh, September Peaks. This is episode four of this season, and we're going to be covering Rest in Pain and... We're going to be covering Rest in Pain and The One-Armed Man, episodes of Season 1 of Twin Peaks. So, Episode 3 opens with Cooper and Audrey sharing another breakfast, and Cooper realizing that she had slipped the door, or, sorry, Cooper realizing that Audrey had slipped the note under his door the night before. The note referring to One-Eyed Jacks, uh, which is a brothel, um, basically right near i think right on the uh, u.s canada border it's a it's a pretty much a sex club and it's kind of awful and uh the ben and jerry horn are completely which it is funny that they're named ben and jerry um but Je ben and jerry horn are completely okay with it they have no qualms with trafficking young women and grooming them to basically be sex slaves for cash and um so at this point, I think uh, Truman and the rest of the Twin Peaks sheriff's people have been on to them. They just haven't had concrete evidence or anything that tied them directly to crime, you know, like to be able to convict them. So now Cooper uh, talks about his dream with Harry and uh, Lucy after the whole conversation with Audrey. Cooper's colleague, Albert, uh, wants to actually do another um, autopsy post-mortem on Laura's body, but uh, the body was due to be released the day Albert uh, wants to do this. So there's this big conflict as to, because they've already done an autopsy, the people in Twin Peaks are very upset with Albert for wanting to do this, so there's this whole conflict of, Albert trying to proceed and the, you know, Doc Hayward and a couple other people are kind of arguing with him in the morgue. Uh, and it's, it's upsetting. It's, it's, it's upsetting and also absurdly funny in a way because these people are fighting over a dead corpse. Um, but it's also, I don't know if it's supposed to be darkly funny, but I found it kind of funny in a way. Um, but it's also indicative of how much the small town of Twin Peaks cares about each other and how outsiders, although welcome, are not understood fully uh, and don't understand fully the people of Twin Peaks either. So, um, Truman ends up uh, throwing the right hook at Albert and knocking him pretty much right on his ass. And... Uh, Cooper then is like, all right, man, get out of here. Like, go do your job or whatever. Like, I'll take care of this guy. And then pretty much tells Albert that he was he was uh, proud that Truman hadn't hit him sooner. So uh, Cooper was all about, you know, that's one of the things that I think everybody loves about Cooper. Is he's all about respect and, like, having reverence for things that people revere themselves, you know. Um... Albert later reveals that uh, Laura was bound by like a cheap type of rope. She had been addicted to co cocaine and had also been clawed by some type of bird. And there was an unidentified plastic shard uh, in her stomach. So then um, later on, Leland is at home when he's visited by his niece, Maddie, who is also Cheryl Lee playing that part. And uh, Leland has this weird obsession from here on out with Maddie that, because she kind of looks like Laura, that he has this weird, like, want to connect with her, but also, like, think of her as his daughter, but he, it's also weird because there was this weird vibe between Leland and, and Laura, and I don't want to really spoil that, but... So that's this whole weird thing that goes on throughout the first, I think, first two seasons. Um... And at the same time, uh, 
Cooper and Harry uh, talk to Leo, or yeah, talk to Leo about Laura's death. Um, and it's pretty obvious that he's not telling the truth when he says that he doesn't know Laura. And Cooper and Truman both like definitely pick up on that. Um, and then they have uh, Laura's funeral in this episode, which is actually really beautiful. And it's one of the most iconic shots of Twin Peaks is all the people kind of standing there at Laura's funeral because it's kind of an integral point of Twin Peaks where because this girl has died and they're kind of having closure over it, there's this moment of passing um, that I think the whole town kind of falls into a certain level of like somber um, after that. So uh, James arrives late to the funeral and... Bobby ends up flipping shit and, like, basically calling all of them, like, murderers and, like, saying that, like, we had killed Laura and that, like, he was just losing his mind. He was really going off. Um, but then he and James kind of end up having a little tussle and uh, Leland, uh, Laura's father, ends up falling into the hole onto the casket and, like, crying. Um it's really fucked up. Not a lot of people talk about this, but Shelly later on in that episode is kind of making fun of uh, Leland for having a really emotional moment in the diner to, like, customers. And I just think that's kind of fucked up because it's like... He's at his daughter's funeral, man. Like, he just let him do what he's got to do. You know, he's kind of, like, losing his mind. So I think anybody would lose their minds if they lost their, like, child, you know? Especially at that young of an age. She wouldn't even adult yet so fuck you Shelly um so then uh, pretty much all the guys meet and they tell Cooper about the bookhouse boys and uh Truman explicitly explains that someone has been smuggling cocaine into Twin Peaks and he suspects uh Jacques at the bar uh, at the um, Roadhouse Bar is involved in some way. Um, he also talks about how the woods around Twin Peaks are like mysterious and they have a certain evil to them that has permeated into the town, he believes. And I think it's one of those things that's kind of like a prophecy. Like He thinks that because there's this bad shit happening that it's the darkness from the woods causing it, which could partially be true, but I think it's also one of those things that it could mean, I, I think it could be what happens later in the return when there's like real darkness in Twin Peaks and there's like horrible shit happening. I think he could just be like predicting the future but not knowing it. Um, and I've kind of thought that a few times watching the show, but I don't think I've ever said it on the video, so there you go. Um, but then they bring, they bring Cooper to the Bookhouse Boys headquarters, where uh, James has one of Jacques' brothers named, like, Ber Berard or Bernard or something like that. And he's kind of, like, tied up. And... Uh, He's like, no, nah, no, nah, I, I did not do any crime. He's supposed to be, like, French, I guess, but he's doing this, like, horrible French accent, and it's really, it's really cheesy. Um, I remember it being really, really bad, and, like, every time that scene comes on, I'm just, like, at face palm because I'm just, like, this is terrible. Um, so then Jacques uh, eventually realizes from a weird signal they have at the roadhouse that he's in trouble. And he calls uh, Leo to come help him. Um, when Leo leaves his house with Shelly, uh, you see that she has a piece in a little drawer uh, that's on, like, the side of a cabinet that she kind of just, like, she, like, looks at it and puts it back. And it, it's so funny because they do that, of course, because it's a TV show, but it also, I think, is telling of, like, she's thinking about it but she's not doing it and there's this whole struggle she has with kind of dealing with Leo and and it's a very real struggle and they make it really real with Shelley's character and um, Madison Amick's uh, acting is just phenomenal 
she really pulls it off when she cries too. There's a lot of points in the series where she's just bawling her eyes out, and you really believe it because she doesn't look like movie crying. She looks like she's ugly crying, and it's not common. Like a lot of the movie actresses, just like fake cry. And she really looks like she's just bawling her eyes out. She's devastated. So she does a good job there. Um, I think, yeah, then Truman uh, goes and talks to Josie. And uh, she tells Harry that Catherine, I think just Catherine, but she may say Catherine and Pete, are like plotting against her. And they want to take over her mill. Um, and she actually tells Harry that she's aware of um, two ledger books that they've been keeping for business there. Which is super illegal and would also like kind of implicate Catherine into some level of crime. Cooking the books kind of thing. So, yeah, that was pretty much the end of that episode kind of leaving a cliffhanger of like why does she have a secret book it's kind of fucking weird um but I was just gonna go through a couple little cool things I found out about the episode too um what you won't be in the episode yeah, you can be in the episode. You can be in the video, Char. That's my cat, Charlie. There was supposed to be a scene originally, apparently, where Cooper went to the graveyard after the funeral and talked to, like, a, a, a crypt keeper type guy, like a, a old dusty, dusty motherfucker. And, um, and basically was like, hey, man, what's going on? And the guy was like, you can talk to dead people if you listen to the ground. And, like, it was just one of those weird-ass scenes that didn't really have, um... All those weird, like, lynchy type scenes, so... That was one thing I had to, I had to mention, because that's just fucking weird. Yeah, moving on to the One-Armed Man, uh, technically episode... Five... I think. Well, it's episode four. But if you include the... Um, yeah, it's confusing. But the one called the One-Armed Man. Um, Andy is at the Palmer residence speaking with Sarah. And she is kind of describing how she saw Killer Bob. The creepy guy in the jeans jacket with the hair. And... Uh, he tries to do a, a sketch of him, and he actually does a pretty good job. I'm, I'm pretty proud of Andy. He, he shows some artistic prowess here. Um, she also tells him about the dream she had of uh, the gloved hand kind of taking the, the golden necklace out from under the rock. And uh, Donna has a particular problem with this because she's the one who hid the necklace. So she's like, what the fuck? How does she even know about that? Um, <laughs> Cooper and Jacoby have this, like, weird confrontation on this, like, super long conference table in this room. And they do these weird Kubrickian shots where it's very symmetrical, but it's also awkward because Cooper's probing Jacoby for answers and Jacoby's kind of just twisting it back onto Cooper because he's a psychiatrist and it's very strange. Um, and he, he pulls the whole like oh well I got doctor patient confidentiality so I can't tell you about this stuff bro and um, but he does admit to kind of not understanding Laura and not really connecting with her the way he wanted to I guess as a patient and as like a I, I think they never really say explicitly, but you assume as a lover, too, in a weird, like, messed up way. Um, and Jacoby mentions a guy who drives a red Corvette. And I think Laura mentions that later in this season, but 
it, it all kind of points to Leo. So it's like, what the hell's going on with Leo? Um, Gordon Cole, played by David Lynch, uh, makes an appearance, I think, in voice only, um, and calls Cooper at the sheriff's station, and he's basically like trying to give him some some advice, but also talking to him about Albert and like everything going on. And Cooper's like, he was way out of line, Gordon, and you should be here, and you should see what's going on. It's some bullshit. Um, but then uh, Cooper also gets a call from Hawk, who has found the one-eyed man, one-eyed, the one-armed man, um, and then they kind of corner him at a motel. And the man revealed to be a guy named Philip Gerard is a traveling salesman who sells shoes. And um, they do a, like a weird, awkward joke where um, he has like only one, like a right shoe for every pair. And Andy's like, why do you only have one? And he's like, oh, these are my, you know, these are my like show shoes. I, I actually like show people these, so I don't have a pair on me. And it's just funny because it's like, dude, the guy has one arm and he only has, like, one of every shoe. It's just, like, horribly dry Twin Peaks humor. Um, but at the same motel, too, this is really weird. Uh, Catherine and Ben Horn are having an affair. And... Uh, they're not talking about taking over Josie's mill. They're talking about burning it down and destroying it, sabotaging her business. And uh, later in the episode, uh, Ben Horn actually meets with Leo Johnson and hires him to destroy the mill. Um, Norma, who's like the really lovely... Uh, lead waitress slash owner of the Double R Diner uh, is at a parole hearing for Hank, her jailed husband. And she's very uneasy about the whole thing and trying to be supportive, but also not feeling super confident in being supportive. And uh, she's also uneasy because she's having an affair herself with Big Ed. And the two of them fit really well together, but it is also messed up that they're having an affair, so it's it's a double-edged sword, you know? Um, but to support Hank, she does promise him a job at her diner, so he will have a stable employment after coming off, uh, coming out of jail. Um, and Shelly... In following in suit with uh, Norma's wonderful example is having an affair of her own on Leo with Bobby Briggs and um, she shows him the shirt she found in one of the previous episodes and Bobby uh, pretty much vows to get rid of it for good uh, in fear of Leo finding it and knowing that they fucked with it and like tried to hide it uh, Cooper, Truman, and Andy uh, visit a vet somehow in connection with the one-armed man. And um, there they find some of the rope, I think, that was uh, used to tie Laura up the night that Leo and Jock had her up in the cabin the night she died. Um... But then they also uh, believed that the bird that had harmed Laura had bitten her and uh, the bird that had been hinted at in, in previous scenes had been a patient there. So they start looking through all the records and they find that there was a minor bird named like Fido or some shit like that um, that belonged to Jacques Renault. So they uh, they raid uh, Jacques' house and uh, interrupt Bobby Briggs, who's planting Leo's shirt that he was getting rid of uh, for Shelley. 
he gets away uh, and the police don't get him, but they find the shirt there as evidence. At the Double R Diner, uh, James meets Maddie and uh, they actually have like a little thing going on, which is weird. Uh, and Nora fi- Norma finds out that Nate. Norma finds out that Hank has been released from prison and uh, he actually calls Josie uh, that day and uh, leaves her a very unsettling message on the phone. So it's a really good episode, a pair of episodes. Um, It progresses the kind of background and the the vertebrae of the story of Twin Peaks and like how all the down-to-earth stuff is going on while also trying to figure out all this weird shit that's happening. Um, yeah, a couple really good pairs of episodes... Well, a good pair of episodes for, uh, for some Ten Peaks. So, this was episode four. I really appreciate you guys listening. I hope you enjoyed. Um, oh, you know what? I gotta, I gotta do... There was a couple more things about this episode I wanted to say, too. Hold on. Yeah, there's a really great moment at the vet's office when uh, Cooper has this awkward one or two second moment with a llama, and they just make weird, crazy eye contact. And uh, the actor playing Cooper, Kyle McLaughlin, confirmed that it was just a happy accident. So this was something that uh, just kind of happened spur of the moment, and they captured it on camera, and it's one of the best character like quirk moments for Cooper ever. I think it's hilarious. Um, So I guess uh, the direction of uh, episode, the direction of the One Armed Man, that episode was actually inspired by a film called Fallen Angel from 1945. They used a lot of split diopter shots as well as uh, small sets. And this episode was only allowed because uh, Lynch and Frost had a lot of respect for uh, Hunter, the director. And um, it had both split diopter and uh, a few Dutch angle shots, which are not very common in popular shows. But Tim Hunter, the director, was allowed to use these by, like I said, French and uh, Lynch and Frost, the uh, producers and creators. Um, I guess because they had some artistic uh, confidence in him. So that's. that's pretty awesome there are a couple little more artistic moments in this episode so um but yeah that's pretty much all i had to say uh and like i said i really appreciate you guys listening uh i'll be back with episode five and then uh i'm gonna do two episodes there and then i have two uh well hold on yeah two more and then the last episode is going to be uh me and tommy J. I'm going to get those probably put out the next few days. If not today, then Wednesday. And, um, yeah, so I really appreciate you guys listening, and I hope you have a great day. And uh, stay safe.